we take that which God has spoken and we put it into word form and make decree. Some things just have to be spoken. Well, good morning. Nice to see you. How many of you had graduations to go to this week? Anybody else? Had? I had a couple of them. Yeah, it's good. Had uh, my oldest grandson graduated from eighth grade, and uh, Judah, right here, at uh, Bethel Christian School. That was fun. And then my oldest granddaughter graduated from high school this week, uh, from Foothill. And uh, and I, when I walked up to the stadium, I noticed it's called Bill Johnson Memorial Stadium. I thought, man, I bet that was a lot of work to get that prepared for me to come to see my granddaughter graduate. And then I thought, memorial. What do they know that I don't know? (laughs) Are are they prophesying? What is that? It was so. It was so fun. I, I, uh, I was. The stadium is here, the football field and all is here. So every, every, all the parents, all the family, friends are here waiting for the kids to come around here and march down to graduate. Well, I'm standing up against a railing and I notice they're walking in from behind. So I've got my, my iPhone ready and I thought, I'm going to get the coolest video that no one else in our family is going to have and I'll be able to airdrop it to them. So I'm taking the video and got the video and I'm thinking, this is cool. So I get over to show Benny the masterpiece. I don't know what I did. I actually do videos quite well. I think the devil took over my camera. <laughs> I think uh, something, I've got to blame somebody besides me. I, I got the railing and then I got my hand. It was like I put my hand right over the lens the whole time. So here I am following Kennedy. Not knowing it. I'm watching her smiling big going, this is awesome. Never looking at the screen to realize She's not on there. <laughs> oh, well, we got some other good photos, but it was a very, very fun night. And uh, I, it's interesting, uh, when she graduated from eighth grade, Eric came to me, <clears throat> oh, probably in May, so the, well, this is June, right? Yeah. She graduated in June of uh, like four years ago. And Eric came to me in May, he says, Dad, you're scheduled to be out of town on her eighth grade graduation. I went, oh no, when is the graduation? So he gives me the date, and I'm in Europe. I've got two conferences going on. And so we made the necessary phone calls, and one conference let me leave a day early, and the next conference let me come a day late. And so I flew home from Switzerland to Reading, went to eighth grade graduation, then flew back for the rest of the conference. It was awesome. I made it, I made it. I I felt so good that I actually was able to get there for the, the big event. So that was fun, that was fun. I have a blonde joke for you. I apologize ahead of time, I just apologize. But my wife is blonde, so I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. Bob walked into a sports bar around 5.58 p.m., sat down next to a beautiful blonde at the bar, stared up at the TV. 6 p.m. news was coming on, The news crew was covering a story of a man at the top of a 10-story building preparing to jump. The police were trying to talk him down. Fire crews were below setting up nets to catch him. The blonde looked at Bob and said, do you think he'll jump? Bob said, you know, I reckon he'll jump. The blonde said, I bet he won't. Bob placed $20 on the bar and said, you're wrong. The blonde placed her money on the bar. They kept watching the scene unfold. Suddenly, the man stepped to the edge of the building, did a swan dive off the building, falling into the fire crew nets below. The blonde was very upset, but she willingly handed over the $20 to Bob. Fair is fair, she said. Here's your money. Bob replied, nah, I can't take your money. I saw this earlier on the 5 p.m. news, so I knew he would jump. She said, I saw it earlier too, but I didn't think he'd do it again. Probably blonde jokes shouldn't be allowed in church, but until they're outlawed, I'm going to keep doing them. So. <laughs> so funny. Open your uh, Bibles, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 
I, I mentioned the graduations this week because one of the privileges that I had this week was to actually speak at the eighth grade graduation. And, uh, and I, I shared the verse I'm going to share with you. It's, uh, this concept has been on my heart for a while, just for me personally, uh, because I believe that the Lord is trying to sh- stretch me uh, in ways that I've not been stretched before. <clears throat> so we've got 1 Timothy chapter 1. We're going to start with verse 18. <clears throat> Excuse me. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected concerning the faith and have suffered shipwreck, of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. I want you to look at me with verse 18 and the first phrase of verse 19 again. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you wage the good warfare, having faith and a good conscience. It's uh, interesting to note that um, a, a clean conscience is actually connected to strong faith. A defiled conscience actually undermines and weakens faith because, because we know. We know. We know that there's been um, compromise. And compromise is like, is like putting dirt into cement. It just weakens the whole process. It won't settle. It won't be a strong foundation to build on. And so it's not that answered prayers come because of our righteousness. That would never be the case. But there is something to be said about treasuring and protecting a clean conscience. And what's important in this passage is to see that strong faith works a parallel road to a clean conscience that feeds from a clean conscience. I want to read the same passage to you out of the Passion Translation. So Timothy, my son, I'm entrusting you with this responsibility in keeping with the very first prophecies that were spoken over your life and are now in the process of fulfillment in this great work of ministry in keeping with the prophecies spoken over you. With this encouragement, use your prophecies as weapons as you wage spiritual warfare by faith with a clean conscience. Listen to this last verse or this last sentence again. With this encouragement, use your prophecies as weapons as you wage spiritual warfare by faith and with a clean conscience. I I love that. Now, I'll tell you what what has uh, really been hitting me of late has been this whole idea. Prophecy, first of all, is God coming to you with a word of promise about your future, about, about destiny, about where he's taking you. But here's the sobering part of this this analogy to me, is that he's saying, that's where I want you to go, but you won't get there unless you use the tools I give you. That's fascinating, that God would actually give us a word that has to be implemented correctly to step fully into our destiny. Larry Randolph put it the best. He really gave me language for this, and it's helped me a lot. He said, God will always keep all of his promises but he's not obligated to keep our potential. God will always keep all of his promises, but he's not obligated to keep our potential. So think about the the implications of that. There is something that is in God's heart. It is actually, he's given us the tools or the weapons, whatever it is that we need to get from here to there, he's put in our hands. But unless there is the good fight of faith, where faith is expressing the tool, the good fight of faith, we do not automatically step into what God has promised. It's critical to realize that. I, I've been in a season lately where I've been doing a lot of uh, waiting and resting for God to fulfill words. 
which is an important part. Because here's the deal. There's two basic ways that we make advancement in this kingdom. <clears throat> One is the Mark chapter 10 passage where Jesus said, unless you receive the kingdom as a child, you will by no means enter it. So you can only enter, you can only walk into what you've received. So that has to come, has to come first as a gift. It's something that he does on my behalf. He provides for me. It's like receiving an inheritance. If you sit in a lawyer's office and he reads off uh, what you've inherited, you've not worked for it, it's not wages, it's simply a gift. It's the result of somebody else's labor and you're receiving a gift. That's what this uh, Mark 10 passage is all about, is that we receive as a child. Child is what? Inheritance, identity. In my place, I know that I'm a child, I'm a son of God. We're sons and daughters of God. We receive what he's given to us freely as a gift. But there's the Mark 11 passage that gives us the other side of the same coin. And that is where he says, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. So here's this this contrast of receiving as a child and taking by force. Both are essential, but if you try them both at the same time, you'll hurt yourself. You, you get a whiplash or something. I'm not sure what'll happen, but it'll be painful. You can't, you can't rest and receive and fight for something at the same time. It's, those are two different seasons, two different moments, uh, uh, moments in life. So here we've got, we've got this concept of possibility, of promise, that which God has arranged for us, designed for us, equipped us for, and yet it won't be experienced unless I responsibly steward what God has put in my life, specifically his word over me. The word of the Lord will get me to where the will of the Lord is for my life. It's not automatic. It's, it's the fact that God has, is willingly taking me into a conflict. Now here's something interesting. I don't, forgive me, I don't have chapter and verse. I forgot to, to, to get this uh, for you today. But there's this part of the story with Israel. Israel is being taken out of Egypt, into the promised land, excuse me, into the wilderness, into the promised land. So early in their journey, I, it was within, I think, the first year, out of the land of, uh, out of Egypt, there is an enemy right here. And the, and the Lord says, if I, if I take them into this conflict, they will want to go back to Egypt. They don't have the strength as warriors yet to fight through that battle. So the Lord said, so I'm gonna take them around. Which is interesting, because if he doesn't take us around a conflict, it's because he's equipped us to win the conflict. That's the, that's the implication is that he cares for us more than we care for us. But he's trying to build something in us. And there are certain things that can only be built in a fight. Some things can only be built in rest. Knowing when to just simply observe. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. Some things can only be absorbed in the posture of rest, knowing that God is working on our behalf. And yet there's this whole other realm that requires conflict. <clears throat> so God only takes me into a conflict, I'm equipped to win. But the next thing about conflict is conflict builds strength. It's, I guess the proverbial example would be the chick that's in the egg, uh, trying to hatch out of the egg. If, if I crack the shell for it, it will end up dying because it was the fight out of that shell that gave that baby chick circulation to its limbs where it would actually survive hatching. It was the fight out of the shell. If you crack this shell for them and get them out, they will actually just lay there and die because there was no fight to strengthen them for their own survival. What is this? This conflict, sorry, this conflict is actually to strengthen us in character and in resolve so that once we enter our quote unquote promised land, we have the integrity to stay there. See, if Israel is supposedly 11-day journey from Egypt to the promised land, 
if God would have taken them 11 days straight into the promised land, they didn't have the integrity to stay there. They would have wandered out. There's things you learn in the battle that you need to stay in, in the land. There's things you learn in the fight that build that strength of heart, that strength of character that enables us to live with maturity and steward well that which God has promised to us. Paying attention to what God has said and is saying, I, I really love, I, I, I love the prophetic, I love promises. I, I, I learned to read the Bible for me. I, I, I just, I read it for me. I didn't read it for you. I still don't read it for you. I read it just for me because it's all about me. It's all about me. So what I read, I am reading so that I can eat. I'm honestly, I am feeding my soul. I am not looking for sermon material. Anybody can regurgitate what somebody else has said. I want to know what he's saying to me. And as it gets filtered through my experience, my thinking, my personality, gifts, whatever, then it becomes material I can pass on. But it's got to hit me first. And I love, I love reading the word for, for just seeing what God is saying about my life and what he's doing in the earth today and all, all that stuff. My phone, I, I mentioned I think a month or so ago, but my phone and my car get along very well. They're very close, very, very intimate friends. Um, because of Bluetooth, Bluetooth brought them together in just a marvelous way. And uh, when I get into my car, when I drive home this afternoon, um, I'll just put my phone in there it's already set up. They've already got an ongoing relationship. Even though they are separate right now by 100 yards, when I get back into that car, they will reconnect. And when they do, it'll be beautiful. And what my car does is it randomly picks things off my phone to play for me. Now, I could program it to play just, you know, this album or this music or this prophetic word or whatever. But I like the randomness of my drive home because I don't know if I'm going to hear the Beatles sing A Hard Day's Night, if I'm going to hear a Jimi Hendrix version of the Star Spangled Banner, or if I'm going to hear Brian singing You Can Have It All, Lord. It's, it's all in there. But like this week, twice, I heard Bobby Connor prophesying to me from 2013 because it's in here. It just randomly brings it up. And I just love that. It just makes me want to go around the block to see who else is going to prophesy to me. Because you never know. I mean, this is stuff. I've been driving down the road, and Cindy Jacobs gets on there and starts prophesying about our new building. And this is like 10 years ago. Starts prophesying. I'm going, I just need to keep driving. I, just need, I need to think of somewhere else to go because this is, this is good. But I love the prophetic. I love entertaining in a sense of, of welcoming, admiring, and giving place to as a host would entertain someone in their home, I want to entertain the prophetic word over my life. You see, the battleground initially for us is the mind. The battleground is here, it's right, right between the ears. <clears throat> Paul talked about this in 2 Corinthians 10 in such graphic ways that it's, it's almost frightening, uh, sobering, sobering is a much better word. He described the strongholds of thought in our mind, strongholds. So think of stronghold as we would in the medieval days or something. You've got, you've got an army, a, a battalion of soldiers, and they're in that castle right there. And there's this huge wall that surrounds this castle, and they are safely in there. And at night, they send out troops to fight and to do exploits, but they're safe in that environment, in that castle. <clears throat> The Bible actually describes a stronghold, a castle like that, exists in the thoughts of people. So if I think wrong consistently, each thought is a block in the wall that eventually gives the enemy a place to hide. It's a place of habitation, a place from which he kills, steals, and destroys. So repentance starts with a sorrow, but the sorrow provokes us to a change of thought, a change of thinking. It is dismantling the wall that I have built that the enemy has hidden behind. And now he is exposed and is easy to deal with. But when you create a castle for him to live in, 
you've given them permission. Does that make sense? So if I'm constantly believing a lie, then what I've done is I'm actually making agreement with the accusation, the deception, the manipulation, all the tools that the enemy uses. I've made agreement with that, which means my authority I have, I have now lended to him. Because Jesus said, when, after he rose from the dead, he said, I have all authority in heaven and on earth, which means there's somebody out there who has no authority. Right? He says, I have all authority, which means the devil has none. So here's the deal. He passes on authority to you and me to implement his purposes in the earth. But when I listen to the deceiver and I make agreement with his words, he then is able to function out of my delegated authority, at least in measure. I empower. When you believe the lie, you empower the liar. So the battleground then is, first of all, first and foremost, in the mind. You remember uh, Ephesians 6 talks about the armor of God, which is a, basically is saying God is your armor. Put on Christ, takes care of the whole package. Put on Christ, takes care of the whole package. I, I heard somewhere recently, yeah. So here's this picture of the armor of God. And he says, the helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, girded with truth, feet ready to share, to preach the gospel, shield of faith, sword of the spirit. Helmet of salvation. You have to think saved. My thoughts must be consistent to the saving work of grace in my life. When they violate that, I give place. I'm not talking about you know, being demonized and all, all this. I'm just talking about there's a weakening. There's a weakening of our posture, of our position. There's a weakening of our position to enter more fully into the promises of God over our life when we give ourselves to these lies. I'm about 10 minutes away from fear and discouragement any day of my life. All I have to do is think on the wrong stuff. I mean, it takes me 10 minutes to get there and a week to get out. I mean, it's just not worth the effort. It's way too much work. You know, you fall down that hole and you're just fighting to climb out for a whole week. You know, it's just not worth it. I've decided it's not worth it. So instead of entertaining the lie, if, if you want an interesting study, read, read Nehemiah 4 and 6, those two chapters, and you'll see the tools that the enemy uses. They're, they're outlined very clearly, especially in chapter six. But he used, the enemy uses things like uh, accusation, um, distraction. See, if the enemy can't get me to sin, he can't get me to morally sin, steal money, uh, abuse people. If he can't get me to do that, what does he want, want to do? He wants to distract me from my purpose. He wants to get me out of my lane because if he can't get me to fall, at least he can get me to lose impact. When you step out of your lane, I step out of my assignment, I take on somebody else's responsibility. What happens, I'm not capable, I'm not able to do my task and theirs. Does that make sense? So the whole issue of distraction. So look through, look through those two chapters and you'll see just a list of accusation, manipulation, all those kinds of tools that the enemy uses for every one of us. They're, they're repeated in our lives constantly. The key then is to be so anchored in what God has said that nothing else is appealing. The only time the devil's words are appealing is when I've lost sight of what God has said. The only time the lie looks reasonable is when I've lost sight of what God has said. Think. Saved. Think saved. Having the value system to maintain a clean conscience is just huge because it, 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 it keeps the heart in a place that is so free to grow. You understand, faith comes from the heart, right? It doesn't come from the mind. But a divided mind will defile the heart. Valuing a clean conscience puts me in a place to 
to experience ever-growing faith. I love when God gives us a word, and I, I've got several uh, just in my life right now that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm reviewing because I have come to realize in the last, oh, just short time, last two months, especially maybe the last even couple of weeks, even more profoundly, that the Lord is, I've been waiting for him to do something when he's been waiting for me to do something. I've been waiting for him to do something when he's been waiting for me. You, you remember the whole story when uh, the disciples woke Jesus up in the boat. He calmed the storm. And then he turned to them and he says, he says, why are you so afraid? How come you don't have faith? And I'm thinking, wait a minute. I have faith. I knew who to come to. I came to you and asked you to calm the storm. And you did a good job. Thank you. I give you praise, I give you thanks, I give you honor. And the Lord was looking for something else. There are times where he does not want to do something for me, he wants to do something through me. And discerning those moments, those seasons, that to me is the fragile part of life. Because there are times where I want to rest and he wants me to act and there's times I'm fighting and swinging and he says, man, you need to chill. You know, <laughs> sit, down, sit down and rest. If you get this victory, you're going to think you did it. You know? And there's just times where we have those moments that just shift. <laughs> I had a, a pretty funny experience. I wasn't going to share in this service because it's televised, but <laughs> you'll understand why in a moment. I'm I'm not that transparent of a person. Chris would tell you anything, but <laughs> I'm a lot more personal and private than he is. <clears throat> not necessarily a strength of mine, but it's re reality. I, about 35 years ago, this is a little embarrassing. I, I don't share this ever, as in ever, <laughs> public. I shared it with some doctors once because they would understand. Actually, twice with a group of medical. I had, I had this problem. An abscess in the rectum. Don't picture it. It's just gross. This kind doesn't come out with prayer and fasting. It has to be cut out. I, didn't, I just didn't tell anyone. And so I'm, I'm at home. Dick Mills calls. Dick Mills, our dear friend, the prophet, he would call every once in a while. He'd say, hey, Bill, I got a good word for you. And he would, he would just call and encourage me. He's just such a father of encouragement. And he calls me one day. He says, Bill, he says, I got a good word for you. I said, yeah, what is it? I didn't tell him what's going on with me. I'd, I'd rather know what, I'd rather, I didn't know what was happening. <laughs> I'd rather I go in for a dental procedure and I come out fine. That's all. Yeah. So he calls, he says, I got a good word for you. He said, yeah, what is it? What is it, Dick? And he says, I've got this scripture for you. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. <laughs> I'm not sure what to do with that, but I receive it. <laughs> Amen. Some people think God doesn't have a sense of humor. I have... Never forgotten that one. God will always speak to your need. And leave it there. Although at Twinview, I just I remembered after I said that that Moses wanted to see God's glory and God just let him see his hinder parts. So I'm not sure if there's a correlation there or not. I'll probably stop right there unless it, this thing bottoms out entirely. <laughs> or, <laughs> oh man, and this is televised too. Hello. In Weaverville, the church was Assembly of God Church, and certain mail programs would abbreviate assembly. I'll just leave. That's it right there. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm pulling out of that, that fateful direction. All right. <clears throat> so the battleground is here, 
But once victory is obtained in how you think, you have to do something with what was said. See, many people in this room, you're just one proclamation short of a victory. One proclamation. Because the word is not supposed to be used harbored. I believe in that a lot. I, Mary is my hero, the mother of Jesus. How she handled what was spoken over her was, was just stunning because it, she's got the shepherds coming. She's got the wise men coming, Anna, Simeon. They're all coming with these words about her son, about Jesus, the eternal son of God that she gave birth to. And it says two things about what she did. She treasured these words in her heart and she pondered them in her heart. These two things, treasured, pondered, treasured. Treasure, to me, implies that this that has been spoken is not for common use. This is not like, you know, I've, I've got, Benny and I came back from being with some friends uh, in Asia, and they sent us home with two of these most magnificent goblets, glasses, made out of this finest, they're like $600 each. And these people sent it home with us. You know, you don't let the kids use that in their lemonade stand out in front of the house. You, you understand what I'm saying? Why? Well, it's too valuable, right? You, what do you do? You treasure it. You put it in a safe place to be brought out at appropriate times. The appropriate time is when you want to ponder what God has said. It says she pondered these things. The word things, there's the word rhema. She pondered these freshly spoken words of God. She would bring them out. They're treasured. She'd get along. She'd bring them out. She'd dwell. She'd think about that he has, he's the, he's the savior of the nations. And, uh, and Anna and Simeon said, behold the Christ child. You know, they can now die because their lives have been fulfilled. And so she's pondering these words and considering about her son Jesus, about the destiny, the purpose of his life. I owe it to him to treasure and ponder. Treasure, it's, it's not up for a vote. It, this, this isn't Facebook material. This, this is about destiny. And I'll share it with whoever I'm supposed to share it with. But until it's to be brought out of the treasury, I've got to keep it there to protect it. And then when I bring it out, it's to ponder, consider, let the full effect of what God has said infect me inside and out so it changes how I think, how I see, how I interpret present situations. Because if I'm facing a battle, it's only because there's an enemy the Lord has allowed there because he has equipped me to win. And the tool that I'm supposed to use is this that God said. Use the prophecies over you to get to where you're supposed to go. So here we have, you've got a family member that's just not walking with the Lord. And it's not just, oh, you know, I, I just thank you that all is well. It's take the word of the Lord. As for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. And you begin to make proclamation, confessing the name of the individual. And you proclaim, this is the will of God and it shall be done in my household. Every single family member will serve the Lord and they will serve the Lord with purity and with great joy. It will be with great delight they will serve the Lord. And we take that which God has spoken and we put it into word form and make decree. Some things just have to be spoken. Psalms 103 or 104, I forget which one, on the left side of the page, <laughs> right there. It says, the angels give attention to his word and the voice of his word. Interesting, isn't it? To his word and the voice of his word. This is how I understand it. <clears throat> there are times where God declares a matter. He just declares over a situation and the angels know their assignment whenever they hear his voice. They know that that is what they are supposed to enforce. They are to enforce the word of the Lord. But there are times God doesn't make the decree. He's the still small voice in your heart and mine. And the angels don't get their assignment until they hear our proclamation. There's a lot of unemployed angels because there's a lot of believers who won't speak. They don't know the assignment until they hear the word of the Lord. You say, well, we don't boss angels around. I'm with you. We don't. You can yell some great idea you have all day long. It's just going to exhaust you. Nothing will happen. But they can tell when a word originated in the heart of God. They can tell when that that I just declared came from the throne room itself. 
It carries the fragrance of God's own breath on that word, and they know that's their assignment. So here we are. We're in battle. We've got the shield of faith, all the armor on, and we've got a sword. And that sword is what we use to bring about victory. It's taking seriously that which God has said. It's very easy to want yet another prophetic word. Another promise. I, I'm, I'm there. Count me in. If there's good words being handed out, just, I'll get in line. I, I, I will get in line. Benny and I were just with about 20 of our 10-year-olds, and it took uh, like 45 minutes just to prophesy over us. It was just glorious. It was great. So cool. Amen. If there's a good word being spoken, count me in. I want it. But the good words oftentimes are not decrees of what he will do without us. They are decrees of what he will do with us. Oftentimes he's revealing, this is my will through you, not just for you. The terminology that Paul uses here specifically refers to be summoned, being summoned into the lifestyle of a soldier. Now, just think with me for a moment. We'll wrap this up. A person who's in battle, and a number of you have served our nation or the nation that you are from, you've served in battle, in war, and on the front lines of battle, you just don't have very many concerns. I mean, you have concerns, but you could care less what's on TV. You know, the, the amount your water bill has risen at home doesn't really matter. I mean, all, all you care about is keeping your head down, having enough ammunition, knowing where your friends are. I mean, that's it. It's just, it's just all that's in life somehow gets reduced to staying alive and making advancement. It's wisdom for us to know the difference between the season of rest where we watch him do things for us and the season of war where we take what he has declared and we refine our focus so that very little matters besides victory itself. My cry today, and we're going to pray for us in just a moment, is is my, my cry is that the Lord would give a fresh word of promise to every single person in the room, a fresh word. This time, not a word that you get to rest in. You have those. But words that you can fight with. You get alone with God. You're driving down the street and you just begin to make the decree. This is what God has said. I'd encourage you, if you don't already know how to do it, obtain the liberty to remind God of what he said. It's an it's a unusual exercise in Scripture. You see what Daniel, God, you said after 70 years we'd be released from bondage. You see this, the reminding of God. God doesn't forget. He doesn't need reminding. But I need to know that I am working in conjunction with what he has declared, and I'm using my right as one to pray appropriately, and there is no more accurate way to pray than to pray what God has said. It's for our sake entirely. This fight that I am in for this breakthrough changes me. If I could handle the breakthrough without any more change, he would bring it to me. But because I need to change In order to occupy that which God has promised, he wants me to fight my way in. So put your hands out in front of you just as a posture of receiving. And I want to pray both for the release of promise and for the grace to handle well what God has said. So Father, I I come to you in the name of Jesus. And I, I ask for us as a church family, those are family members that are watching on TV, I just pray for all of us together, everyone in the building, our children's workers, everyone, 
that today, the next 24 hours, would be a day where you release a fresh word, a fresh word of promise, a fresh word of hope, something that we can declare, we can confess, we can sing, we can pray, we can implement what you have designed for us wholeheartedly, all of our emotion, all of our thought, our mental exercises, everything engaged to, to see you perform what you've declared. I ask for that gift and for the grace, the divine enablement to carry this out. I pray for this in Jesus' name. The greatest miracle that could happen today is the salvation of a soul. It's the forgiveness of sin. There is not a greater miracle. I've seen so many crazy things happen through the years where God has healed people, where blind eyes and deaf ears. And I remember I was with uh, Heidi. You know, we prayed for Ronald and Heidi earlier. I was with Heidi in Mozambique, and these two blind men came into the into the uh, kind of a tent uh, sanctuary they have there, open air. And they came in on a Saturday, and they wanted to see, and they were both blind, and, and it was crazy. One of them, his eyes were just solid white. Was, there was no pupil. There's nothing. It was just solid white. And... Uh, and Heidi prayed for a moment, and then she said, come back tomorrow, and you will see. And then he came back the next day, and we prayed over them. We got to watch as these eyes literally just formed, and God opened their eyes. And they, they went from there. We all walked across the highway to the sea where they got baptized in water. So tonight's baptism, be here. All right. That, was that, that was just came on me. It was divine inspiration. I'm sure it was. And I've seen amazing things happen, but there's nothing that equals the salvation of a soul. But you can take a person who has no hope in life and give them hope, a new nature, and forgive of their past. That is available for everybody in this room. And I, I want to just throw out the net, so to speak. If, if you're one of those that are here today, and you say, Bill, I don't want to leave the building till I know I'm at peace with God. Then I want to pray with you right now for you to be what the Bible calls born again change from the inside out. If that's you, just quickly put a hand up. Just real quick, because I want to I pray with you if, that's, if that is your, your, your place. Real quick. Right here. Yep. Beautiful. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yep. Beautiful. Nothing like it. Anyone else? Real quick. Got, one, got another hand right here. A second hand. Anyone else? That's so cool. I want to have all of you stand, if you would, and I'm going to ask this. We've got a team down here. We call them the Freedom Team, and for these two that I saw, and if there's any others, please, 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 please make your way down to this team. They just want to bless you and pray for you, love on you a bit, and, and talk to you about this that Jesus is doing in your life. Anyone wants to join them, please do. This is your invitation to come and know Jesus. So come, step out of your seat. I want to have the ministry team come very quickly to the front as well because uh, we, we want you to be ready to pray and uh, for people in this room to receive their miracle. Chris, come on up here. Yeah, come on down right over here to my left, uh, right over here. Bless you, bless you, bless you. Thank you, Lord. Well, Father, we just pray for a real spirit of breakthrough to rest on the house today and for miracles in people's bodies that, uh, that it would just multiply, multiply, multiply in Jesus' name. Thank you so much, Lord. Okay, amen. Hang on for a moment. Chris will give you some instructions. 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 Instructions.
Connection of the 
say proudly that I love you and your love is great. You are such an amazing man. I have seen love before, but I never felt that great before. I can say proudly that I love you and your love is great. You are such Such an amazing man I have seen love before But I never felt that great before I can say proudly That I love you and your love is great you are such an amazing man I have seen love before But I never felt that great before I can say proudly That I love you and your love is great You are such an amazing man You have Such an amazing man You have awakened a part of me You have created something I never knew You not only care about me But you only respect me as I am You are such an amazing